Hi everyone, welcome to the show. I'm Dr. Nicole and today we'll be talking all about skin issues in children and teens and how those can be connected to other health problems and what we can do to address root causes. Um, I find that many children struggle with conditions like eczema or acne or rosacea or those types of things and they can be frustrating to resolve. I've dealt with that both as a parent and also as a clinician. And what many people don't realize is that these kinds of skin related issues are connected to other kinds of health issues and including mental health issues. Same kinds of things that can cause problems on the skin can also contribute to issues in the brain. And I find more often than not that kids that are coming into my clinic for developmental or mental health kinds of challenges also have one or more significant skin issues going on. So to help us understand these connections and what we can do to effectively treat these issues, I've invited Dr. Raja Sivamani on the show today. Let me tell you a little bit about him. He's a board certified dermatologist and practices as an integrative dermatologist at Pacific Skin Institute. He's an adjunct associate professor of clinical dermatology at the University of California, Davis, and director of clinical research and the clinical trials unit. He is also an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at the California State University, Sacramento, and an associate professor of dermatology at California North State University College of Medicine. He engages in clinical practice, as well as both clinical and translational research that integrates bioengineering, nutrition, cosmetics, and skin biology. Such an interesting combo, we're gonna ask him about that. Uh, with training in both allopathic and Ayurvedic medicine, he takes an integrative approach to his patients and in his research. He's published over 100 peer-reviewed research manuscripts, 10 textbook chapters, and a textbook entitled Cosmeceuticals and Active Cosmetics, third edition, with a passion for expanding the evidence and boundaries of integrative medicine for skincare. It is such a pleasure to have you on the show today. Welcome, Dr. Sivamani. Oh, you're so sweet. I'm, I'm super thrilled to be here. Uh, I love your podcast. I love what you're doing with it. I'm, um, I'm also super jazzed to talk about skin any chance I get. Yeah, awesome. And skin for kids, because often this is something that, you know, people aren't talking about. And it's something that comes up often in my clinic work, but also we've had lots of questions from listeners about these kinds of issues for their children. So I'm excited to dive into it. I want to start with just give us a little background of how you came to be doing this integrative work that you're doing, because you, your um, educational and career path has taken some interesting twists. You know, we've got the bioengineering, we've got the, uh, the med school, the nutrition, the Ayurvedic medicine. How did all of that kind of come to bring you to this point? You know, I think with all good things in life, you want to paint a picture that was super organized the whole way through, <laughs> but you kind of just let life come to you. And I think that's the first thing is you just, you just let life give you what's going to give you, and then you just go with it and not resist as much. Mm -hmm. So yeah, in the very beginning, I just loved engineering when I was an undergrad, and I thought, this is really fun, get to really think through problems. Um, get to understand what are the building blocks. And I think that's the major, I think that's really what inspired me to go integrative mm -hmm. is understanding that they're building blocks to everything. Mm -hmm. And so then when I went to medical school, we memorized so much, but I started thinking about, well, what are the building blocks that I need? Mm -hmm. And I saw big holes in the building blocks. I saw a big hole in nutrition. I saw a big hole in thinking about mind body, even thinking about, and when we say nutrition, I mean, you think about supplements, you think about herbs, you think about foods and what's the right diet for me and when I started looking at all of that I started realizing gosh you know medical school is amazing loved it went to UC Davis absolutely loved it but I do have to say I felt like there was a big missing piece in there mm -hmm. that I just didn't get and so I went to train in Ayurvedic medicine because I wanted to look at uh, the person a bit more holistically not just biochemical pathways and and uh, diseases I wanted to know how do you what's the science of living well and sometimes in medicine, it's not a science of living well, it's a science of how to get someone back towards what we consider healthier, early reactive medicine, as I call it. But if you're thinking about preventative medicine. Mm -hmm. So then I went into Ayurvedic medicine and I've loved research and putting those together has really given me, I think, some, uh, some insight into how do you combine engineering, the building blocks, how do you take that to then build these bridges between alternative uh, approaches like Ayurvedic medicine and then, of course, conventional medicine. 
And Nicole, you're absolutely right. Skin of children is a little different than skin of adults or skin of really older folks. And it's developing, it's starting to, what I say, find its way to thrive. And so you kind of have to help it mm -hmm. come, in, come into its own. Yeah, awesome. So, you know, people often uh, don't associate skin problems with other aspects of their health, right? It's like, oh, I've got this rash or my child's got these dry patches or, you know, we, we've got these issues going on. And they tend to, like with lots of things in medicine, just look at it as an isolated issue, right? Oh, put some cream on it, you know, make it go away type of thing. But really the skin is kind of um, a, a way of showing us other things that are going on, right? I mean, the skin can be a, a red flag for uh, more root level issues happening. I'd love to have you talk about why it's not just about what we're seeing on the skin. I'm so happy you're bringing this up. This is such an important point. Sometimes it is easy to say, oh, it's a dry patch or stop itching. Uh, how many times have we heard this before? <laughs> this poor child that has eczema yeah. and you say, stop itching. Or even with acne, they say, oh, it's just acne. The psychological consequences are mm -hmm. so profound. And this isn't just about, oh, I'm feeling you know, down. I mean, this is truly feeling left out socially or feeling uh, like you're not getting enough sleep and tired and not doing well in school and then losing confidence in yourself. So for example, with eczema, eczema is not a problem of just the child. It's the problem of everybody in the house. If the mm -hmm. child's not sleeping, the mother and father are not sleeping. The siblings may not be sleeping. Everyone is tired. And then they go to school, they don't have that concentration level the same way that another child might. And yes, they are itching, but it's not, it's not their fault. And I think sometimes it's easy to blame the child or something like that, but the psychological impact of not getting good sleep, but also maybe kids make fun of them. And then with really bad acne, um, psychologically, that's like the time of your life when you're trying to be social, you're developing socially into your um, early teens and mid teens. And so if you don't have that confidence, the way you present yourself, um, yes, maybe for today you say, oh, you know, it's a, a little bit of acne. I'd never say that, by the way. I'd never say it's a little bit of acne. But what about tomorrow when you go for an interview, when you're an adult? Mm -hmm. All those habits that came from childhood persist. And so I think building those healthy habits early is probably the best prevent preventative medicine or preventative approaches to wellness. Start as a child. And mm -hmm. so, yes, the psychological impact is, is massive. And we've got actually several really good studies on that, particularly as it relates to acne in preteens, teens, young adults, showing the very profound psychological consequences of having these unresolved skin issues. And you're right, I mean, it's connected to depression, anxiety, social isolation, just all of those things. So it, Absolutely. it, it is so important that we don't just minimize that and say, oh, you know, it's not a big deal or, oh, it, it's, it's not connected to anything else it's, it's a really big part of kids physical and mental health and the other thing is that it's hidden sometimes because children don't always tell you when they're going through something that's tough unless right. you specifically ask I can't tell you the number of times um, that I've had children bring things up and the, and the mom and dad say well why didn't you why don't you tell me about this mm -hmm. and I think we have to realize children don't see it as a duty to tell their parents sometimes if they're feeling bad sometimes they hide it because they they don't want to feel guilty that they're going through it right. and um, I think it's important to engage them in the constant uh, in the conversation but they definitely are going to feel slight social isolation or even overt social isolation or some sense of confidence that they lose or whatnot and we have to engage them in that and I think it's part of the treatment process too. Yeah, absolutely. I love that you look at it in that full like 360 degree whole person kind of way. It's not just about what's going on on the skin. Um, and so beneath that then, so we see these symptoms on the skin. You know, we, we may have a child who's got these really red, scaly, itchy, dry patches that won't go away. Or we've got a, a kiddo who's, you know, really struggling with um, acne or you know, other kinds of things. We see that on the skin, but let's talk about what's going on beneath the surface there. What do you, what are the things that you think about when a, a child comes in with these issues? I mean, yeah, I see these symptoms on their skin, but, but what do we need to be thinking about beneath the skin level? 
Yeah, this is also a really important question because I think, um, and let's start with the eczema as a first example. If you look at eczema, um, a lot of folks want to know um, what else is causing this, whether it's internal or external. And I think that's where this beneath the skin part or deeper to the skin part is really important. There's the understanding that, especially with the eczema, there's an environment outside of you and inside of you that plays a role. But then there's also your internal tendencies. In Ayurveda, we call it tendencies. In Western medicine, it's kind of the genetics, but the epigenetics is what's being actually expressed in your genes. And so, you know, if you have a lot of family members that have eczema, you're just going to have a higher risk because some of your genes are going to predispose you to having a skin barrier that's not as good. But then comes the question of, well, what about food? What about the things that we're eating? What about our bathing practices? And I just want to touch upon a couple of these. Yeah. So for, for one, when it comes to food, we know that by and large, usually food may play a role, but it's not the overarching driving factor. So I try to really be mindful to parents to not uh, restrict all foods because you don't want them to get malnourished. Mm -hmm. And malnourishment can be very insidious. It can kind of take form and you might not realize it's happening. And then eventually um, it, you can be in a situation where you say, oh my God, my child doesn't get enough nutrition. But there are certain foods that we know that if you know it flares, and the, the best way to do is eliminate one food at a time. And, um, and the ones that are the bigger culprits are eggs, mm -hmm. and uh, in many cases, dairy. Um, and dairy is a controversial one because we don't want people to necessarily take dairy off if mm -hmm. you know, it's important for the child to grow or if they have some sort of a condition where they don't have good growth. Mm -hmm. And because dairy is very good at um, mm -hmm. building bones and building muscle and things. Mm -hmm. But that being said, um, sometimes we want to think, oh, there's this one uh, food that's going to be uh, an end-all be-all. And I think it's really important to work with someone closely on that. But I think nutrition is an important piece. The second thing, believe it or not, bathing habits make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we want to soap because our people don't realize that body wash still counts as soap. They think a body wash doesn't count as soap, but body wash is still a soap. It's still washing your body uh -huh. and stripping things off. If you have a child that's dealing with eczema, the more soap you use, maybe, you know, armpits in the private areas, go ahead and do that. But on the rest of the body, when you use something like soap or a body wash, you still are stripping off their natural oils. And as it is, one of the issues is that your natural oils are a little bit deficient when you have eczema. And so... I try to tell people, be careful about how you bathe. Then, of course, if you have eczema and it's a flare, we'll talk about treatments. But I think it's important to look at the lifestyle habits that are there because those are actually, believe it or not, going to be the make or break between whether you're going to have long-term control or if you're going to continue to be fighting these flares mm -hmm. over and over again. So that's one small example. Acne is another one. Mm -hmm. Um, there we now know that with a lot of epidemiological studies, a lot of studies that are looking at the connections between food and um, acne, if you have foods that are high in refined sugars, mm -hmm. sodas, sweetened teas, by the way, teas are great, but if they're sweetened, they tend to have a big sugar load. Yeah. Dairy, believe it or not, non-fat and low fat is um, a bigger insulin spiker than uh, full fat dairy. But dairy by and large, now we can see there's a lot of connections there. And you know, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I have teenage boys that are willing to restrict their diets and they come in and they tell me, oh my God, my skin's getting better. And of course you put in the other treatments. Mm -hmm. but I think it's important to talk about that inside out approach. Mm -hmm. um, it's really important to bring in that role of nutrition too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that's a piece that often miss that is often missed in the conversation. You know, when I see patients, they come in and some of them who have been struggling for years and years and, uh, you know, on all kinds of skin creams or medications or things. And the parents will say, oh, nobody, nobody talked to us about what we're eating. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and I think that the general point you're making that's really important for people to understand is that what we put in our bodies impacts us in every way. We talk a lot on this show about how the food that we put in kids impacts how their brain functions. Well, it impacts every part of our body too, including our skin, right? So you know, eating a lot of high sugar processed, junky kinds of foods is going to impact our skin as well. Yeah, there's no question about that. And the other, the other aspect of treatment that I think is really important is the big bad boy for eczema that I think a lot of parents worry about is um, steroids. Yeah. And uh, steroids are actually very, very effective. Um, I'll tell you a small little thing. You know, a lot of my colleagues know that I'm integrative and they'll, they'll have a parent that says, oh, I don't like steroids. And so I'm sending them to you because I want to see if you have any alternative approaches. And then I'll see them. We'll have the full conversation. In some cases, actually many cases, 
if they're flared, mm -hmm. I'll put them on the steroids and my colleagues will say, oh, what did you end up doing? I'll say, I start them on steroids. They said, no, no, I thought they didn't want steroids. And I tell them, no, no, it's not about not wanting steroids. It's about having a full conversation, understanding where steroids fit into that yeah. treatment. Because I think the big fear is, oh, my child's going to be on steroids forever. Mm -hmm. The steroid withdrawal. There's ways to manage that so that you can include it as part of a holistic treatment plan. And same thing with, with acne, you worry about antibiotics. Yeah, and it's the right. same approach. Find a way to bring those antibiotics down, but tell parents, you know, what's the context and why we're using them. Mm -hmm. And if there are alternatives, go towards that. I think you're so right that often the resistance is simply that the, the uh, recommendation of medications are not discussed in a broader context of, and here's all the other things, right? Yeah, and right. so parents feel like I just keep getting handed this prescription, but I don't have any other tools and this is still a problem and they feel like they're just putting a Band-Aid on it. But when you talk about it as here's the role these medications are going to play and here's the other things that we can do you know, on a foundational level to help with this, that, that makes a big difference for parents and for kids to understand how these things fit together. Yeah, exactly. And I think also letting parents know that there's different intents. So Western medicine is really good at getting things down quickly. Mm -hmm. So if you have a bad flare, as much as we might want to address something like diet that might have a slow effect over time, the child sitting in front of you is miserable. Right. And so you need to get them into a, into a form where they feel confident that, hey, I'm getting better. And even the parents can feel a bit confident, like, okay, now the symptom's getting better. So I think you're always managing what we call acute care with chronic management. And so mm -hmm. it's important to put those into perspective as you, as you uh, have the conversation with your doctor. And you know, doctors should be looking at that too when they're having the conversation with you mm -hmm. as a patient. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I want to touch on uh, lifestyle factors too. You, know, you, you talked about um, food, you talked about, uh, you know, the bathing kinds of things. But, you know, you and I have had previous conversations around other lifestyle issues like stress, oh like, my gosh. you know, uh, getting Absolutely. enough movement, these kinds of things, which again, people typically go, why are you talking to me about that? You know, my kid's got this skin <laughs> issue going on. Um, <laughs> you know, what, what are some of the other lifestyle related things that you see that play into these kinds of uh, chronic skin conditions that, that people have? Oh my God, this is such a huge area. Um, we, we generally are poor at being able to reflect upon our stress from, I think uh, from a Western society standpoint, because we're so, it's so easy to get it caught up in the daily um, things that we have to do and stress just builds up. Even for our children, you know, yeah. they're going through school and if you just take a child that maybe isn't doing so well in school, it can snowball on the mm -hmm. child because, you know, you didn't get a good grade. So now you have to study harder, but then studying harder puts more pressure. Then you have to get a good grade and then it, it can just kind of go back and forth. If you have some ways to kind of break that cycle and just spend time thinking about things like meditation or doing yoga together mm -hmm. or just doing something that takes your mind off of um, the stresses that are there, it's huge. And I think, um, I, and one thing that I do talk about to a lot of um, parents and, and patients is getting involved in yoga early mm -hmm. and doing something together in that form. Or another option would be if, um, if you're really thinking about meditation, they have these great apps now. And I have no, uh, no connection to any of these apps, but I know some of them like Calm and Headspace. Yeah. A lot of folks find it, it's a great way for the family to engage, not just for you, but you can bring your child in. And how, how great is that if you could spend a couple minutes every day at the end of the day just saying, hey, let's do this app together. And it's kind of fun for them because it's technology. And, uh, you know, it's not so esoteric at that point because you get to use your, your whatever it is, your phone or something and iPad or load up the app and, mm -hmm. and away you go. So I think this mind-body connection is so huge and it does play a role. There's no question. So I appreciate you bringing that up too, Nicole, because this is such an area of need. Well, it is. I mean, we just see more and more kids and, and just families in general being so burdened by high levels of stress. And, you know, we talk about that a lot from the psychological standpoint of things, of how that reduces anxiety, gives kids better coping skills, helps with mood, sleep, all of that. But I, I love that you're talking about this too, because it, it then registers for people that, oh, this time that we're spending doing a little bit of yoga or some guided meditation or a, a, the call map or whatever, huh, that also 
can help with my child's physical issues, like, you know, the skin problems they have going on. Say, say a little bit about why there's a connection there. Because some parents might be listening and they're going, how does doing some yoga or, you know, doing some, uh, a breathing app or something with my kid, how would that have anything to do with their skin? Well, first of all, I think um, when you think about stress, stress is going to impact cortisol levels in the body. And we also know that the immune system plays a role in, in much of how you deal with inflammation. And so when you have stress, it sometimes will stimulate a higher inflammatory response in your body. And so the same person, and this concept in Ayurveda is known as ojas. Ojas is this concept of, can you take on stress and how does your body respond to stress? And we know that the more stress you get, the more you're depleted and the more you feel. And, and, and even in the Western world, we have this very safe concept. The more and more stress, stressful your life gets, you hit a point where you start to we use the term burn out. Mm -hmm. And when you start to burn out, it's not just you mentally. I mean, your body can do the same sort of a thing where it's not able to deal with inflammation as well, or it starts to have hypersensitivity, meaning you have more itch than before, you have uh, less sleep, because stress impacts sleep. The less sleep you get, the less rejuvenated your body is, and away we go into the cycle that's not healthy at all. Yeah. And so uh, I think that's where stress is a major impact. And, uh, here, and here's an example, and this is an example that I like to give uh, patients, whether they're parents or even if they're adults. Mm -hmm. um, I had a patient that came in that was dealing with stress and it was a really challenging uh, situation with her eczema and just dry skin. Mm -hmm. And I talked to her about putting on a moisturizer, mm -hmm. but putting on a moisturizer shouldn't feel like a chore. It should feel like a self-love situation. Mm -hmm. And so in Ayurveda, we have this concept called self-abhyanga. The concept is abhyanga, which is massage, and massage with oils. And so now we know that there are a lot of natural oils that might be good options for when you're moisturizing a child. And we tell parents, even if they're babies or little children, start early and get them to start uh, incorporating um, the abhyanga, which is like massage onto themselves, or even you do it for your child. It doesn't take long with an oil. Ayurveda is a little brilliant. They figured out if you had something really sticky, it would take forever to put it on the body. But if you use an oil, you can go faster. And I think that's a nice way to connect with your child, whether it's sunflower seed oil or coconut oil or something that you can put on the child. If you do that, you start to make a, a bond that's beyond just putting on a moisturizer. You're actually touching the other person. I think that sense of touch is yeah. huge. And, and as a child, if you start to see that touching your body is something that's really normal in terms of, and I'm talking about obviously in just like arms and legs, right. we're not going anywhere that's inappropriate right. here. Right. But um, so it, it, just doing that and getting them used to a routine of moisturizing and, uh, and, and seeing how their, their arm feels or their or leg feels or their hand feels, mm -hmm. they get a better sense of self. And that's something that I don't think we've explored so much in studies, but it's, it's there. And I see a lot of my patients when they start doing this self up young approach, they have a better boost in their mood. They have a better boost in their sense of self. And also uh, moisture, moisturizing becomes a part of um, what we call therapeutic meditation uh, yoga. It's like a mental yeah. yoga for themselves. So uh, the stress really does have an impact to go back to what you're saying. And then there are some ways to have, have a way to bond around that. I love that in such a powerful way to just strengthen the parent-child relationship too, which is so important for uh, healthy minds, healthy bodies, that those relational pieces and, and how maybe something that we might consider a chore, right? Of, oh, I got to get this stuff slathered on my exactly. you know, kid after the bath. It's like, oh, wait a minute. I can reframe that into a few minutes of really meaningful bonding and interaction, calm you know, my child, calm myself in doing this and really turn, uh, really get a lot of, of mileage and a lot of ways out of such a basic thing. Yeah, there's no question. And yeah, that bond, that parent-child bond, huge, huge, mm -hmm. huge. We uh, can't underestimate that at all. That is so huge. So yeah. I think, I think and, and you know, the other part is it's really fun to see them in follow-up because mm -hmm. you can see sometimes that the, especially when they're smaller children, that their, their gears are going and they're realizing that my skincare is also part of me. And it's not something that they then say, oh, I hate my skin for it. They realize there's actually a way to love their skin despite it. 
So fabulous. And I'm thinking too, just um, that it helps kids to feel empowered and to feel like they have some control over um, their, their body, their health. It, it gives them something meaningful to do. And I think when, when patients, whether they're children or adults, feel a sense of empowerment in that way, um, that goes a long way to, to helping with treatment too. Yeah, you know, we have this sense, even with the Instagram world now and um, just on TV, everything is so perfect. And mm -hmm. so sometimes children see things and they realize, oh, everyone around me must be perfect. And as we go grow older, we start to realize, oh, wait a minute, that's not the way the world works. <laughs> we all have imperfections. And then you kind of come into your own and realize, yeah. okay, I have to embrace this. And some of us get there sooner than others. But eventually, I think if you, if you look at anyone that's near the end of their life, they'll, they'll tell you, gosh, you know, life is just a bunch of turns. And, mm -hmm. you know, you just find your path and not everything's like a perfect carved, uh, you know, Instagram story. But, you know, I think it's really important for children to realize that early because um, I think it minimizes their, their um, psychological uh, yeah. devastation that could occur if they think everything has to be perfect and they are imperfect. I mean, that's yeah. the worst thing that you could do. Right. And so teaching them that I think really is the role of a physician too, is to let them know that, Hey, you're, um, I, and I hate to use imperfections, but I say, Hey, your unique qualities are what make you special. Right. And, and sometimes, you know, when they come in with a little weird mole and they say, what's this? And I say, Oh, looks like you got kissed by an angel or something. You know? so <laughs> there's just it. like different ways to put yeah. that together so that they see that it's actually kind of cool. Right. But how we frame that stuff for kids and the language that we use makes a profound difference in how they see themselves and how they see those things, right? I think that's oh, absolutely. so important. Um, I want to get into, for a few minutes, you're talking about some of these um, root level issues, other things that contribute. Let, let's touch on the issue of the microbiome as it relates to skin things, because I think that there's more out there about that. Now, like a lot of our listeners are familiar with the gut microbiome, you know, uh, balancing the microorganisms that, uh, you know, live in our body and, and can support um, our health. So what are your thoughts on the relationship of the gut microbiome to skin? Uh, I know that the skin also has its own microbiome. Many people might not be aware of that. So let's touch on that a bit. Yeah, this is probably one of the funnest areas for me to talk about because we do a lot of research in this area. We not only look at the skin microbiome, which by the way is super rich, a um, lot of little niche, niches as we say in environments, micro environments, and then the gut microbiome. So to start with the gut skin connection, we already know there's definitely a gut skin connection um, because when you eat certain things, it does affect your skin. But the microbiome is um, really interesting. We have a unique mix of um, ways that we can communicate with the rest of the body from the microbiome. Some small examples are things like short chain fatty acids. Those are chemicals that are released by different bacteria. Typically, we think of them as being good for the body. And so there are good bacteria, as we say, quote, good bacteria that um, are high producers of short chain fatty acids that we think then can then go through the bloodstream and then connect to the skin. And, it, and then this is just one chemical. There's many different that we are still uncovering, but that can impact the skin. And we find in some of our research that short chain fatty acids um, can be anti-inflammatory to the skin. So if there are ways that we can boost those bacteria in the gut, then we think that that might have a relationship. We are early, we're just figuring out how these bacteria shift and change. But I also tell people we're not too early. We're actually, we have tools that we can look at that. Now the skin one is really, really interesting as well. I, I personally find the gut one fascinating because it allows me to connect alternative medicine approaches with Western research approaches so we can meld together Ayurvedic concepts with Western medicine. And we are publishing a few articles on that right now. We yeah. published one on curcumin. We're gonna um, have one on triphala, which is an herb that comes from Ayurvedic medicine, looking at how that shifts the gut. Now the skin, Oh my God, the skin is so rich. They have so many crevices that you don't even realize. Every hair follicle has a, what we call an invagination into the skin and it's full of microbes in there as well. So you have actually multiple environments. You have the environment that's oxygen rich right on your skin. But then you have the areas that are within the hair follicle that might be a bit more oxygen poor. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we call an anaerobic environment. And so you have different sorts of bacteria that live on your skin. And not only is it bacteria, you have yeast, uh, we know that you have mites that live naturally. I don't want anyone to get weirded out. They're like <laughs> supernatural mites that live on you. Believe it or not, they live symbiotically. In some cases, they could get out of balance. But 
one example with eczema. Mm -hmm. In eczema, when people flare, uh, and it was a really nice study done um, by Heidi Kong and Julie Segri uh, at the NIH, where they tracked children with eczema before a flare and then when they got into a flare. And believe it or not, their diversity of bacteria on the skin shifted towards only having a dominance of a certain bacteria called Staphylococcus aureus. Mm -hmm. And that preceded the flare. Now, is that a chicken or the egg story? We don't know, but we know that some of these markers started shifting before this, the child started getting a breakout in eczema. And then once the eczema was brought under control again, that Staphylococcus aureus dropped down. And this is not an infection. This mm -hmm. is just a colonization and an imbalance. Mm -hmm. And we do know that there's a susceptibility to Staph aureus in uh, children with eczema, but it's very interesting that you can track this at the microbiome level and that there are other bacteria that may, be help, that may help to control the Staph aureus loads. Mm -hmm. So we have natural bacteria that are good, and why does a bacteria shift out of balance? Why does it come back into balance when things get better? All questions that we're trying to approach and understand, but it's very interesting. So clearly you have this community of bacteria, community of microorganisms that um, are controlling the inflammatory state of your skin and the, the state of your skin barrier to some extent. Mm -hmm. So fascinating. And I think, you know, as you're saying, we're on the cusp of just starting to really understand these connections, but it seems like this is the direction, um, you know, that research needs to move, is moving to really understand and move beyond just what we've known and what we've done, you know, up until now. It's like, this is the next frontier of really understanding the mechanisms of how all this works. Absolutely. It, this is really is the next frontier. And I think what we're going to see now as we go along is initially we've been talking about the microbiome as what bacteria are present. And we, we call that, that, I find that akin to saying who lives in a city. So now we know who lives there, but you don't know if that person's a lazy bum sitting and just watching something on TV or are they out there doing something and are they doing something that's good or doing something that's negative. So the next level is functional microbiome related analyses. And um, we're headed in that direction. We already have some of that now. And uh, we'll be working on, uh, even us, we'll be working on some of those studies to understand now that we know what bacteria are there, what are they doing and how can we figure that out? Mm -hmm. So, and it's not just bacteria, yeast, right. again, mites, there's a whole community there. So we need to know who, who's doing what. Well, and so that begs the question, you know, because there's probably many of our listeners are thinking, okay, so if the gut microbiome, skin microbiome, if these microbiomes are related to this, then, you know, can we just give our kids some probiotics and will that help? It's a great question. And um, we're looking at that. Uh, so one small example of where this may be interesting is there was a study that was done, small study um, that was done in acne. Now the study was done in adults, but they compared it against uh, an antibiotic that was given at half the normal dose. But they found that in these two groups that the probiotic group that was given orally did just as well as the antibiotic group, which right then and there, you have to say, wait a minute, there's clearly something more to these probiotics than what we had realized in terms of not only controlling what's in the gut, but they may have effects outside of the gut. And when they put them together, it was synergistic. And we're gonna be doing a study on probiotics and acne that's uh, coming up and should, we'll, see what, we'll see what we find. And then, um, and then also, not only there, if you look even at the level of, um, of eczema, mm -hmm. uh, there was a small study where there was, a, there was a topical probiotic that was put on the skin, a topical bacteria, and they found that that was helpful in restoring balance to the skin. So we're starting to understand that probiotics is not just a buzzword, that there mm -hmm. is some science behind it. Now, probiotics aren't all created equally. Right. But there seems to be some science there in if you can either temporarily shift what the, the balance of your skin is or the holy grail is, is there a way that you can do that more permanently? And this is where food comes into play because yeah. yeah. the foods that you eat probably do control the kind of bacteria that grow in your gut. And then what about the food that we put on our skin? Um, well, we call we have a name for that. It's called moisturizers and topical skin therapies. And so, you know, that's going to be the next frontier is understanding how do what we put on our skin matter. And now, uh, and just to speak to that, yeah, we're about to do a study right now looking at things like parabens and phthalates. Mm -hmm. And if uh, if a moisturizer contains them, does that shift the microbiome more than if a cream didn't contain them? Because we want to look at what is the science there, and what about preservatives that we put in our skincare. So. 
stay tuned. It's yeah. going to be uh, over the course of this next upcoming year or two, we'll have some more research that we're doing on this. Awesome. Can't wait to see that. And that does beg the question then that I, I had meant to ask earlier when talking about uh, things like eczema. Are there things that people should be looking to avoid? You know, it, it's complicated for all of us, right? I mean, I've been there for myself looking at the aisles of products for, you know, my son who has struggled with eczema over the years. Uh, parents come in and they're like, okay, so I'm standing there at the store, I'm looking online and there's 60 different kinds of, you know, moisturizers, some of them even labeled, you know, for eczema or those kinds of things. What, what are some of the things that you feel like um, parents can be looking for either maybe that, that may be better or worse product wise to use on their children? No, this is another really great question because I think when it comes to products, it really comes down to the ingredients that you're using and what those ingredients do. In fact, we're approaching this. We have a website called Dermveda and that's D-E-R-M-V-E-D-A where we're look, taking a deep dive into ingredients and how ingredients do make a difference. And also it depends on your skin type. If you have really oily skin or you have dry skin, um, that's going to be very different. The way you respond is going to be different. So when it comes to things like eczema, and by the way, we have skin typing on there too. It's all yeah. totally just free. Yeah. So um, the, the thing about eczema is that your skin is already has this propensity to be dry. Mm -hmm. So if you use ingredients that are heavy emulsifiers, um, and, and there are a few uh, drying agents that sometimes in soaps, you can see things like sodium lauryl sulfate. Mm -hmm. And um, if you have emulsifiers that just, and emulsifiers are found in thin creams. So the lotions that are really thin, really easy to put on the skin. But the problem is when they're laden with emulsifiers, they'll pull the, the natural oils out of your skin into the emulsified layer. And then when you shower, there goes all the stuff that mm -hmm. was supposed to be on your skin. This whole notion of a, being addicted to your moisturizer mm -hmm. comes up. Yeah. So I think it's important to find good humectants. Humectants are things that help you grab onto water. The classic one is glycerin mm -hmm. and things that are occlusives. And the occlusives that are used conventionally are things like petrolatum. By the way, white petrolatum is supposed to be a purified version of petrolatum. It's less aggravating and tends to go on the skin much nicer. Mm -hmm. So um, white petrolatum isn't just a color. It actually has a meaning to it on purity. Or if you have shea butter, mm -hmm. coconut oil. I mean, there's so many alternatives if you look at the Western versus maybe the oil-based or Eastern approaches. But anything that's occlusive. So those two are really important. A humectant that helps you hold on to water an occlusive so that you help bolster the skin barrier so you don't lose as much water through the skin as easily. And both of those together, together I think are important. So I talk to parents about this. And so it's really important also when you put the moisturizer on, it's important to put it on no matter which product you use, get it on within three minutes of bathing. And I personally have no issue with the child bathing every day. I know there's a lot of controversy. Do you bathe every day or not? I don't have a problem with it as long as you get a good moisturizer on right afterwards. And believe it or not, you start evaporating off the skin. The water starts evaporating off the skin very quickly after a bath. Mm -hmm. And they've done studies. Dr. Eichenfeld has done some of these studies from um, the University of California, San Diego, where if you don't get a moisturizer on quickly, you start evaporating to a point where you've lost a lot of the water in your skin and you don't get that benefit. So mm -hmm. I tell people, usually a minute to two minutes, as soon as you get out, pat dry and get that moisturizer on is the first thing that you do. So, you know, what I hear you saying is that the ingredients are important and that, you know, you gave some a really helpful list of things that we can look for. And does it also make sense then for us to look at these uh, labels on these products for uh, that the more things they have in them and the more chemicals and fragrance and all of that, that those are maybe better to steer away from? Yeah, this is a great point too. Um, fragrances, uh, it, it, it's one of those that you want to try to avoid. Mm -hmm. Now, will it aggravate every single person? No, not necessarily. But we try to be mindful of the fact that when you have really dry skin, you also tend to have skin that gets inflamed more easily. So if something has a ton of fragrances, and by the way, essential oils, unfortunately, go into that same category too. Ah. You have a lot of essential oils. Those are fragrances. They're nature's fragrances. But if you say that's natural, Yes, they're natural in the herb, but they're usually not naturally pulled out and then put into a product. So um, I think essential oils have a lot of healing properties. So mm -hmm. I don't want to across the board right. say that they're, they're bad, but realize that they, are, they have potential to be allergenic. So if you're using a product and it seems to still be aggravating and you look at the label and it has a bunch of essential oils, 
um, that's another culprit. Mm -hmm. And then there's always preservatives in there that I think you have to be careful of. And sometimes they can be hidden preservatives, even if they're fragrance free. Um, it, sometimes if they're fragrance free and they have essential oils, they may still have a fragrance in there. So right. just something to watch out for. So yes, you are right. If there's a ton of ingredients in there mm -hmm. and uh, many of them are fragrances or many of them are essential oils, maybe okay for some of us that don't have really dry skin, but if you have dry and sensitive skin, mm -hmm. you might want to steer clear. Mm -hmm. Super helpful tips. And I, I love that you mentioned um, your Derm Veda website. I was, I was hoping that we could throw that out there because I think it's a great resource for people. So anybody listening can go there, right? And, and there's Absolutely. Uh, the, the information that they get skin typed, they can find, you know, different products. You make recommendations on there. Yeah. So what we do there is it's really all about the skin typing and then ingredient science. And so if you go there um, and you take the quiz, it's a pretty short quiz that we do. And we build in mind body in there. You'll get a really detailed look at, you know, what is your skin types? And we break it really down into we've taken Ayurvedic medicine, traditional Chinese medicine and melded it into the Western science. And so we have the skin typing that's a little bit beyond just oily, dry, combination sensitive. We actually go a little bit deeper because some of these other traditions go deeper into how your skin is unique. And that's the key. All of us have unique skin. So if you go to a big website that's going to give you recommendations on products so that you can purchase a product and you just look for five stars on there, how do you know the person on the other end had the same skin type as you? You right. don't. And none of us would ever take financial advice from someone that was broke, for example. Mm -hmm. So why would you take skin advice from someone that has super dry skin if you have oily skin? Right. It's the same sort of a deal. And then what we do in there is we um, actually analyze ingredients and then we can tell you if the product is compatible to you or not. And we stay pretty agnostic. The mm -hmm. idea is that you go in there and help us build that database too. Because pretty soon what we're going to have, Nicole, is the ability for people to take a photo of the ingredient label mm -hmm. and we'll read the label for you and then return back, you know, how that matches to your skin type. And it's, awesome. it's all meant to just build this database so that we can make better decisions. And eventually, hopefully, we can get manufacturers to be mindful of many different skin types out there such an important project and again coming from you know you and your team who are uh, physicians and scientists and researchers in this um just that's that is just a resource that is helping people now and is going to just go on to help so many more people so i'm so excited that you're doing that we'll have the link for that in the show notes too is that the best place for um people to go any other uh, websites or things that you have out there that that we could point people to to find out more about what you're doing Oh, that's so sweet. Thanks for bringing that up. Well, uh, what I was going to say is this is really a bridge of everything that I've done in my life uh, up until now. It bridges in engineering. It brings in uh, clinical care. It brings in dermatology. So the other website that we're building is called Jiva Factory. J-I-V-A. Jiva just means vitality. Mm -hmm. And factory is just the idea that all of us can get there. There's a way to get there. Yeah. And um, it's all about wellness. And we'll be building that website up and uh, you'll hear more and more about it. It's already, we've got a preview of the website uh, that's up right now, but um, really we'll be building it out to talk more about um, our, our own podcast that we're going to be releasing, which is the Holistic Health Podcast. So that's what we'll be, that's what we'll be up to. It's really just a wellness engineering dermatology and a, a better you. <laughs> Such a fabulous combination and can't think of a better person to be bringing all those things together. I really appreciate you for spending the time with us today. This has been an incredibly helpful conversation and I know um, our listeners will find it really valuable. So thank you. No, thank you so much. And I have to say, Nicole, every time I talk to you, it's super fun. I think what you're doing is super amazing. And um, I just want to say to the listeners, what an awesome uh, show that you've got put together here. I love being here. Thank you so much. And thanks to all of you for listening today. We'll see you next time on the next episode of The Better Behavior Show.